I'm an Englishman coach. <laughs> All right, everybody. So we're going to talk about um, the James Arthur collection, Paddock Grand Complication. Uh, my name is Roland Murphy. I'm a watchmaker. I'm the founder of RGM Watch Company. I'm also a longtime member and uh, volunteer from time to time of helping with timepieces uh, uh, from the museum. So the presentation, we're going to talk about the watch. We're going to talk about um, how it got in the collection. We're going to look at the, uh, at the repair uh, and service uh, photos and some additional details uh, about the watch itself. As you know, a, uh, a grand complication is a, is a rare opportunity to work on, especially one from Patek Philippe. So uh, James Arthur, it, became, it ended up in his collection. He was born in 1842, died in 1930. Uh, as a boy, he loved timepieces. Um, he studied uh, uh, the mechanics of all sorts of things uh, and had a great interest in anything that had to do with horology. He immigrated to New York in 1871 and started Arthur and Company in 1885. His company made mechanical models for inventors, so he made a lot of patent models and things. So that's that. So he was very much, uh, he, even though he wasn't, his business wasn't involved in horology, um, it was involved in things mechanical. But for more than 40 years, he was a very discriminating collector of watches, clocks, and all things related to horology and timekeeping. In 1925, uh, actually it was his son-in-law encouraged him um, to ha give the collection to New York uh, University, um, along with an endowment uh, to preserve the collection, but also to hopefully uh, maybe add to the collection. Uh, he died only five years later. So the watch itself, I, I got some details from uh, Patek Philippe on this. Um, it was, uh, movement was finished in 1942. Uh, the watch itself was cased and completed in 1947. It's a 39 jewel movement, has a solid gold silver dial and solid gold applied dial markers. The watch was sold in the U.S. in May of 1947. I tried to find out which retailer sold it, but the Patek Philippe told me that there's only certain information that they share. They, they, they have that information, but um, they only share certain basic information. They don't want to make those, those things public for some reason. So it becomes part of the collection of the New York University. Uh, the watch was donated by Mr. Uh, Sampson R. Field in 1952 and became part of the James Arthur collection. Obviously, James Arthur never actually saw this watch. He was long dead. But the watch was only five years old, so uh, perhaps somebody who had originally bought it maybe also passed away, and maybe the family decided to, to donate this watch. In 1956, New York University established a watch and clock museum uh, from three collections of timepieces um, that were owned by the university. More than half of them, though, were from the James Arthur collection. At the time, it was the largest collection of timepieces in the Western Hemisphere with over 3,000 pieces. The museum was housed in this building you see here, uh, the Gold Memorial Library at New York University's University Heights campus. Uh, they no longer uh, own that building, but another school actually uh, has that, uh, that building, so it's still there. So talking about uh, the repair and restoration, the uh, uh, museum here was going to make a video back in the 90s, and they wanted this watch to be part of that video. So they wanted it to strike, so they went, they set up, they're going to do this video, what pieces are going to do. They went to, uh, to have this watch uh, to activate the repeater mechanism, and unfortunately it didn't work. So now their plans were thwarted, but they still wanted it in the video. So I was approached and asked uh, if I could help. Uh, with this uh, uh, with this timepiece and get things working again. So, of course, I said yes, because how many times do you get to work on as a watchmaker a Patek Philippe Grand Complication? Um, to be a Grand Complication, the um, traditional term, or let's say definition of that, would be a watch that has a minute repeater, a chronograph, split-second chronograph, and a perpetual calendar. 
if it has those three things, then it can be considered a grand complication. So this work was done over three uh, long evenings. So I worked late into the evening each, each night uh, in servicing this watch. And it was a very dry watch, a lot of hard oils. Um, so each part had to be cleaned individually. A uh, watch like this too, um, you wouldn't really want to clean it um, like you would a modern watch. You don't throw everything in a basket and put it in a, in, in a cleaning machine. So this was, these parts were cleaned uh, mostly individually, in, individually at the bench. Um, uh, also, you would want to keep, even a lot of the screws look very similar. On a watch like this, almost every screw is different. So you want to keep every screw with every part. Okay, that'll be handy. Thank you. So, yes, we have a laser pointer. Thank you, Kathy. So here we see the perpetual calendar, which is under the uh, dial. Uh, you see the, the moon phase and all of the components uh, to achieve that. Um, what is a perpetual calendar? Well, many of you probably know, but a perpetual calendar will give us the correct date each month through the four-year cycle, including the February of leap year. So you, you set this and you keep it running, your date's going to be correct. So here's the module off of the watch. Now, just a point about these photos. These, these photos were not taken uh, with the idea of giving a presentation. They, they were just to document uh, this wonderful watch. They were also uh, taken with a film camera back at the time. So we've had to uh, clean up these photos, uh, scan them in digitally and clean them up. And unfortunately, not all the photos uh, were, were good. I was working late at night with a camera, tired, wrong lighting, and, and taking photos of, of this watch. But um, we were able to save many of the photos, and I think most of these are, are, are quite good. So here we are with the uh, perpetual um, torn down most, most of the way. You'll notice a number of things here. If you look at um, this part here, okay. So th this is what will indicate our month as far as how many days are going to jump. And this little square here, uh, you'll notice three sides are the same. The fourth side is different as far as the height there. You'll see this side here is different. So that is going to be what is going to indicate how many days on February. So this is for February. This whole square here is for February. So we, we know three years in the cycle, it's the same. The fourth year, we have the 29th. So this is our grand lever here. And then down here, this is the underside of that part. So how does this square change? We can see it right here. We have, it's like a Geneva Stopworks. So we have our, our cross here. And then over here, we see the finger. So when, the, when this part is down over on this, once a year, that is tripping this cross, which then is turning that square to a different side. So that's how we're getting uh, the four year uh, cycle having February uh, be correct uh, each year so it can be a perpetual calendar. So this watch, here's a number of those same uh, components off of the, uh, the module or off of the plate. Uh, beautifully finished watch. Um, you have to be very careful with a watch like this. Um, you're not going to call anybody up and get any of these parts. So you have to take extra care um, because you don't want to alter something uh, of this value or have to make something unnecessarily. So there's most of it back to, together. Uh, you'll notice that uh, actually the moon phase, um, there's no place to hold it on the module. That actually uh, is held on to the uh, main plate uh, under, underneath of that, you, which we will see shortly. There, this is, this is where the, uh, this is the boss that is actually uh, where the moon phase will ride on that, but it's interacting uh, with all the calendar parts. That's not typical. Usually it's actually right on the module itself. So here we see pretty much uh, a complete uh, perpetual on there. We have the, the moon on there. You can see all the levers, the jumpers. Um, our uh, our uh, great lever here is in place, and you can see how that finger interacts 
um, with that uh, with the flat there for the for each uh, of, of the uh, years in the four year cycle. So I found in this book an almost completely identical calendar. Uh, it's the Guide to Complicated Watches by Francois Lecoultre. Uh, it uh, was published by Simonian Edition. So if you are curious on exactly how the calendar works, this, uh, this book identifies with by letter each component and explains uh, how the calendar works. So it's, it's, it's quite interesting. And, and comparing this um, image um, to the actual calendar, I, I was amazed at, of just how almost exact it is. You know? So obviously this, this is a traditional uh, perpetual calendar. There's little changes, but uh, it's pretty much uh, almost exactly the same. So under the calendar, we have the minute re re repeater. So we can see up here, we have our minute rack. Under that is the quarter rack. Um, uh, we have the hour. And then, of course, down here, this part over here I'll show you is part of the split second. You'll see this uh, piece here, this lever here. And then there's two arms that go up underneath, uh, which we'll see here in, in a few more slides. Uh, how the split second is actually working. The, a lot of split seconds are, are on top of the movement. This is an under the dial uh, split second mechanism. So uh, looking at the back of the movement, you, you would have no indication uh, that it is a split second. But uh, there's a, a beautiful uh, piece here. Uh, this is the all or nothing piece right up here. Uh, what that is, is if you were to pull the slide on a repeater, but you didn't go all the way up, it's not going to release the racks, so you're not going to get any striking of the of the of the time. That way, you don't get a a, a wrong uh, indication of of what time it is. So you have to go all the way up, then that will release the racks and should give you uh, the correct time. So now we're a little farther down. Um, we can see there's racks prominently here, um, and under this plate is where the split is, and we're going to soon see, see that. That's covering that up at the moment. But we have a better view of the arm here. There's one on the other side, but we'll see that better. So when you would uh, click the, uh, the chrono button for the split second mechanism, it's going to move this, uh, lack of a better word, a column wheel. Uh, and this, uh, this lever will pull that. You can see that lever is hooked to this, goes all the way around here, all the way to here. And then there's a button that comes out of the case that you would press, and that's how we can activate the split second. Okay, now we can see it here. So here's our split system here. You have these two arms or clamshells, whatever you want to call them. Uh, there's a heart here on the on the chrono runner, and that will interact with the split uh, with the split runner. And we can see better now how how this uh, lever goes all the way up and out of the case here. We can have a little closer view of the same thing. And then here is the um, split runner. Now if you notice this little arm here, and there's a spring here on it. So that is what is actually interacting with the heart here on the chrono runner. So when these clamshells come together and grab that split runner, they'll grab the side of this, it stops. But this little arm right here is still going up and down around that heart as it goes around, around that cam. And uh, as soon as you release those arms, it's going to snap back in place where this arm then will jump right back uh, in place with, uh, with, with the heart here. So your, both your, your chrono hands are centered again. So probably going up. Some of these pictures are, are going up and some of them are going down. So some of them are uh, before the cleaning of the components. Some of them are after. So they're, they're not in an in order in that regard. This is probably the end of one of those evenings where I got so far covered it up and wait for the next night to, to keep going. So here we are on the, uh, we consider the, uh, the movement side. Here's where we see most of the chronograph parts. So we see our, our, our minute uh, re, uh, recorder runner here. 
we see all of our components here that will achieve our chronograph. Underneath here is the, is the column wheel. Um, and of course, the repeater mechanism, we have our mainspring under here. We have both of our hammers. Of course, they're fully jeweled. This is a, a beautifully finished uh, movement. Some more photos of the movement along the way here. Now here we have the uh, movement side. We have the balance out. I was looking for some other one, photos. Uh, unfortunately, I, the photos with the uh, um, where you could see the the repeater barrel and all that those those didn't come out, but. Uh, we still ended up with, I think, almost, almost 50 good photos. So very, very nicely finished uh, watch um, and just a joy to work on. It's a, it's a privilege to work on a watch like, like this because it's, it's a rare opportunity because there aren't many Patek Philippe Grand Complications out there as there are. So then we moved on to cleaning up the case. Of course, we wanted to make sure everything was going to work properly there. Uh, we have to make get the slide off and make sure uh, everything is clean. As, uh, the slide is uh, is lubricated properly, and then we get it and get it back together. And there we have the finished watch. So that was where we could uh, I could breathe a uh, sigh of relief because uh, uh, watch complete, no components lost, uh, and everything was working. So I was uh, I was very. Uh, excited at that point after three, three long evenings. Now, we say, well, how did the watch get here? Well, let's talk about that. Um, the New York University, they, they, they relocated uh, in 1964, and all, so that building was gone. So all of the watch items um, were given on loan to the Smithsonian Institution. And in 1982, from 64 to 82, they were just on loan. In 1982, they decided okay, we need to do something permanent with this collection. So they divided it up and gave part of it to the Smithsonian, part of it to the Time Museum, and part of it to the NAWCC Museum here. Um, that was all in place. The watches actually didn't arrive here from the Smithsonian. Uh, the portion uh, that was going to be given to the NAWCC did not arrive until 1985, uh, and this watch uh, was in that group of uh, watches and uh, horological related items. So I'm uh, very, very pleased to have that uh, at our museum here in Columbia. And that's how it looks today in the, uh, in the uh, gallery. If you go into the gallery, how, how many people have seen this watch in the gallery? If you haven't, there's a wall that has three windows. One of them has a Breguet in it. One of them has this Patek Philippe in it. The other one has the Dudley watches in it. They're all three in a row. So look for those three windows and you will find uh, this, this watch. So if you have any questions, I'd be glad to, uh, to answer them. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I couldn't quite tell in the photo, but were they kind enough to build in quick change for any of the settings? There, there are correctors in there, yeah. yes. But it, it does not have a leap year indicator, though, okay. uh, which was not uncommon back then. Yeah. Uh, um, so you have to, you got to find out what, what year, year you're yeah. in by going around and, and, and tripping the, the, uh, um, the months there. But there are a lot of, lot of uh, correctors. I think if we jump, um, I think if I can jump down to one, I can. It was hard to tell if there was. It looked like there might be, but it was just a... Uh, yeah, I, I can show you a couple of those quickly there. See if we can find it here. We'll I, I, I had hoped that product was kind enough to do that. <laughs> so if you look on the calendar here, um, let's find the one with everything on here, most of them are here, hang on here. So if you look here, um, yeah. here's a few of the corrector here. Yeah. Um, there's a corrector here. Um, there's another corrector down, down, down here. Um, so all of those will help you to get this set, um, you, know, uh, you know, fairly quickly once you know what year you're in. That's, yeah. that's going to take the longest. <coughs> all right, any other questions? Yes, sir. What was the title or name of the author of the book you were talking about? Um, Francis LeCoultre. And we can find that image here for you also. Then we can get the exact name of the book. 
the one with the drawing. There it is. Um, a Guide to Complicated Watches by Francois Le Coultre, and it's published by <coughs> Simonin Edition. They, they sell all kinds of uh, horological books. So uh, I can leave that up if you want to get to take, take a photo of it. Any other questions? Did you work on this kind of watch before? Or? I have worked on, I never worked on a grand complication, but I've worked on all those complications. I had done many minute repeaters. I had done minute repeaters with um, chronographs. I had done split second chronographs, but not, not everything at once. So basically, once I removed that perpetual calendar module, put it on the side, I had already done minute repeaters with, uh, uh, with chronograph, just not split. I'd done splits, but they were just split chronographs. They weren't with a minute repeater. So, so it wasn't, <coughs> nothing was foreign to me, but I had to be very, very careful because you're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to, you know, call up and order a part for this watch. All right, yes ma'am. I was curious if the, um, for the perpetual calendar wheel, if the watch itself was shown um, in the picture of the cleaning, is it all riveted together? The yeah. month, the month wheel there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For the perpetual. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Did you did you get a photo of this? No, no, thank you. Okay. I want to jump over the, to that picture. So you're talking about. Um, I'm I'm going to want to get to that to that wheel once he gets this picture. We can jump back to this too if, if, if we need to. You got it. So let's jump back. Um, to where we see the wheel by itself. So if you notice. Right here, there are um, screws. Yeah, that's what I, I couldn't quite tell. There's, there's two screws there, but really, it's just you know, it's really not. There's not a lot of parts there. So you basically have you have this month um, cam here, you have the star, mm -hmm. and then you have the um, the um, cross. Yeah. And then here you have the, the cross is coming through and screwing into the to that square or small. Mm -hmm. Slightly rectangle <laughs> part there. That's really the that's term one. So it does, it does come apart. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Can you go back again? Maybe? I can. Want to go? Want to go back? Yeah. Well, it, uh, didn't quite get the picture. Okay. There we go. Phone is smarter than me. Why don't you come up yeah, when I'm done? Yeah. Take a picture of my screen. That's going to be way work. better than that. Yeah. 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 Anybody else? <coughs> so I just want to let my group know um, it's five to three. And if you guys want to take a short break, I think we're all getting together okay. back in here at 3 o'clock. Very good. Okay. Talk, so. You can come up and, and, and photograph this. Thank you all. Thank for you. Yeah, thank you. All.